Hi, my name is Peterson Toscano. I'm a Bible scholar and I'm an actor. And what happens is when those two things come together, well, I see amazing things in the text that I never noticed before. What I'm about to show you is a performance lecture. I'll tell you a little bit about my discoveries in the Bible and then I will show it to you through performance. A couple of years ago, I was particularly interested in looking at gender and the Bible. Often people think of the Bible, the Old Testament, the New Testament, Hebrew Bible, Christian Bible, with very specific rules around gender, how men and women are supposed to act, the roles that they have. So I asked the question, who in the text is transgressing and transcending gender? Who breaks the rules of gender? Who rises above them? And I was shocked to discover that some of the most important people in the most important Bible stories are gender non-conforming. They don't adhere to traditional gender roles or expectations. And that's what I wanna share with you in this presentation, Transfigurations, Transgressing Gender in the Bible. So I'm gonna tell you stories, some are very well known and others maybe you've never heard before. And we're gonna see men and women and some who are not male, not female, something in the middle or altogether different. So let's go. I wanna start by talking about a character in the book of Judges. Now the book of Judges is probably one of the bloodiest books in the Bible. It's in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, and it's at the time before there were kings in Israel. So there are these judges that rule the nations. And the judges serve as political, military, and spiritual leaders. And they're all male judges, except for one, Deborah. Now Deborah, such a fascinating character. She's a poet, a prophet, a judge, and a warrior. Yet not your typical Jewish mother. I am Deborah. They say I seemed different from the girls growing up, but I remained ignorant to the ways of boys and men until, of course, I married one, Lepidoth, my husband. Then I set about to discover the difference between these men and me. I quickly determined I am as strong as they, smarter than many, wiser than most. I looked further into the matter to unearth the difference between these men and me, and I discovered these men have one thing that I do not, one little thing. I reason surely I have resources I could fashion for myself my own little thing. But being greedy, I thought why not have one big thing? And I love how it feels, long and hard, pressing up against my thigh, this sword, which of course is the next best thing. And with this sword, I have become Deborah. They come here to the palm of Deborah. I judge matters between them, small and great, but I also listen. I listen to the rumblings of our enemies, for there are many on all sides that trouble us. And I listen for direction. You see, I serve as father and mother over the people. After a season of listening, I summoned to my side my trusted general Barak. Barak, I said, our enemy Sisera raises up an army against us. You or to raise your own army. Though outnumbered, fear not, you will have the victory. My general, wise, courageous, turned to me and said, Nay, Deborah, we will not fight unless you agree to come alongside with us. Agreed, general. I will join you and your men. You will have victory, but know that since you ask this of me, the glory will go to a woman. 
We prepared for battle. I put on my breastplate, my helmet, my sword. I entered the battlefield looking like all the other warriors, and we routed our enemy. They fled before us like frightened sheep. And then I saw him in the distance. Coward, our enemy, Sisera, as he leapt from his chariot, escaping our grasp. And this Sisera ran and ran until he came to the tent of Yael. Yael, that beautiful hostess. Her honey cakes are the finest in all the land. Yael, a woman on the borderlands of mixed allegiances. Yael, my friend. She beckoned our enemy into her tent, gave him food to eat, milk to drink, a place to lie down. He begged her for a blanket under which he can conceal himself, and there he fell into a dead sleep. Yael, that beautiful hostess, graceful as a willow, mighty as a cedar of Lebanon. She, too, like me, had her own little thing sharpened tent peg and with that tent peg she quietly stole up next to our sleeping enemy not forgetting all the ways he had troubled our women and she placed the point of the peg at his temple and bashed it through his skull so that when my general came by with his troops she beckoned them into her tents and there he saw our enemy slain he came and reported all to me. Yes, General, it is exactly as I had foretold. And did I not also tell you that the glory would go to a woman? This woman, Yael. Oh, you thought that I spoke of myself. No. I left off being a woman long ago, ever since I became myself. I am Deborah. Now, what I find delicious about the Deborah story is you have two women in the story, Deborah and Yael, and they're very much presented as women in the Bible, but they're gendered differently. They're different types of women. And what I like about that is it shows that there's a diversity in gender. There's multiple ways of being female. If, if I were to create an imaginary line, and on the one side is extreme male, the other side is extreme female, however you define that for yourself or other people have defined it for you. And imagine putting yourself somewhere on the line. If I had a lot of people doing that, chances are we would not have two clumps of people clinging to either side, a binary. Rather, we'd probably have people along a spectrum. And that's what I like about this Bible story. It shows that there are multiple ways of being female. You can present it, you can identify it, you can take on the roles in multiple ways. So that brings me to another story of the Bible um, where we have the same thing happen with two males. Um, and in this case, um, they're two brothers. In fact, they're two twin brothers. I'm talking, of course, about Esau and Jacob. Now, in the Bible, Esau is portrayed as this hairy guy, like super hairy, outdoorsman, hunter kind of guy, leads with his gut. He's off, you know, he'll come in from a hunt saying, feed me, I'm so hungry. Well, his brother, Jacob, on the other hand, maybe his twin, but not his identical twin. He was very smooth, it says in the text. We learn a lot about his body, not a lot of body hair. He was very sensitive in his temperament, it said. And he didn't go out and hunt like his brother. Instead, he dwelt amongst the tents with the women. And in fact, while his brother Esau was out hunting, Jacob was a fabulous cook. And, and it's interesting, you actually don't see a lot of cooking by men in the Bible. I mean, you have Jacob doing it, and then you have men offering burnt offerings unto the Lord, kind of like a holy barbecue to God. But in the Hebrew Bible, there's almost no male preparing food like this. Now, in the Christian Bible, you do have Jesus doing some food preparation. Like There's like large-scale catering that he does, like multitudes. And, um, and then there's that like fish fry uh, towards the end, post-resurrection. But actually preparing a meal, that is something exclusively for females. So you have Esau, you have Jacob. They're these two brothers, gender differently. Now, Jacob, 
clearly is heterosexual in the way he partners with people and has multiple sexual partners and lots of children. Um, but he's gendered differently, and he has a very special son, a famous son, Joseph. Joseph um, is very different from his brothers. There's some interesting gender differences I've noticed about Joseph. And in fact, there's one thing I noticed in the Hebrew that I didn't see in English. And, and so I want to share with you the story of Joseph and reveal this mystery about him in the text. I'll weave it into the performance. And to change the perspective a little bit, I want a different person to tell the story. I want to see the story of Joseph from the perspective of his uncle Esau the big, burly, masculine guy. Let's see what he has to say about him. Yeah, I'm Esau. You probably know my brother Jacob. <laughs> although he went and changed his name to Israel. <laughs> We're twins, Jacob and me, although you never know it by looking at us. I mean, I'm a real man, I'm big, I'm hairy. I'm always out in the field doing real men's work. Well, my brother, Jacob, he's as smooth as a woman. He was very sensitive growing up. He liked to dwell amongst the tents with the women, their cooking, their gossiping, their scheming. He was a real girly boy. And since I was normal, well, our father, Isaac, well, he favored me. Now, don't get me wrong. Although my brother was a girly boy, he liked the women, okay? In fact, he had two wives and slept with both their handmaidens. <laughs> and from those women, he had a pack of children, daughters, sons, strong, strapping young men, all of them. Yeah, except for one of his youngest, <laughs> Joseph. This kid. He was trouble from the day he was born, always crying, clinging to his mother, and then he didn't want to go out to do real men's work. And then he started having these, these, these dreams, these crazy dreams he told everyone about. Listen, boys are not supposed to dream. So one day I pulled my brother aside. I said, listen, you got to do something to this kid. Uh, toughen him up. It's a rough world. They're just going to ride right over him. But does he listen to me? No. He gives them everything he wants, including that robe. Oh, listen. <laughs> I would want nothing to do with a robe like that. For one, too expensive for my taste. A, a royal garment. The kind of garment that a, a king would give to his virgin daughter. It was a princess dress. <laughs> yeah. My brother Jacob, he gave his son Joseph a princess dress. And that kid, he put that dress on. He flitted about the compound like he was some kind of butterfly. And I thought, this is not going to end well. Sure enough, one day when the boys were out in the field doing real men's work, Jacob sent Joseph to go check on them. And that kid, no sense in his head, he puts on the stupid dress, goes traipsing across the countryside, making fools out of all of us. Well, his brothers, they saw him in a distance. <laughs> Who could miss him in that getup? And they said, enough of this dreamer. And they rushed him. They threw him to the ground. They beat him black and blue trying to beat some sense into him. Then they ripped off the stupid dress, tore it to pieces, defiled it in blood, and came back with a bloody garment and a story about how their brother was attacked by a wild beast, and pff, that's all that remained. But later they pulled me aside. They told me what really happened, how they sold their brother to some trader going off to Egypt, sold him as a slave. And, and I thought, well... Maybe it's all for the best. I mean, I'm a shepherd. You know, when you got a weak lamb, you got to take it out. It's just going to bring the rest of them down. And besides, the kid might do okay for himself there in Egypt land where they go in for the whole girly boy thing. Well, through the years, I didn't give him a second thought. I mean, who's got time to mourn? Then we had that drought famine. You know, it comes in cycles. 
You just gotta be man enough to ride it out, but... This time was different. It was like the... Earth was cursed against us year after year. It got so bad we finally sent the boys to Egypt to get some grain. Not to beg. We don't beg from no one. But they were brought before some high official in Pharaoh's court, and at first they couldn't tell what it was. A man or a woman with the, with the headdress and the makeup, the flowing robes. Those Egyptians. <laughs> Turns out, it was their very own brother, Joseph. Somehow that girly boy worked his way up through the ranks to become second in command of the whole kingdom, but they didn't recognize him under all that gunk. <laughs> now this was Joseph's chance to get back at his brothers, to get his revenge, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, you don't let anyone ride over you. But does he? No. Not that girly boy. He goes off weeping like a woman, and then he comes back to try to teach his brothers a lesson. And then he forgives them, and he reconciles with them. He gives them food, he gives them shelter. He treats them like he's their sister or their mother, not like any man that I've ever seen. And in so doing, that girly boy, my nephew, Joseph. He saved us all. Now, I don't know about you, but I always cry when I hear the Joseph story. I mean, it's a very moving narrative, and the way it's constructed, it's, it's really very powerful. Uh, what we're looking at is the story of a blended family. There are multiple mothers and multiple children, and there's a lot of tension in the story about inheritance rights. Who's going to get all this stuff? And some of the older brothers fall out of favor. And then there's a shift that happens because young Joseph comes along and the brothers begin to get worried because he's the favored son. And Joseph's a bit of a brat at times. I mean, he's very precocious. So he lords it over his brothers. He's very verbal, linguistic, and he's always telling these stories and dreams. And then to make matters worse, Jacob gives Joseph this garment. Now, in English translations, it's sometimes translated as a coat of many colors, or a robe, or a robe with long sleeves. But if you look at a study Bible, there's often a note at the bottom, and it says the exact meaning of the Hebrew word is unclear. That scholars are not exactly sure what this garment was that Jacob gave to Joseph. So, if you're going to do some Bible scholarship, you have to ask, well, what is the word in Hebrew, and where else does it appear in the text? Because that can give us some light about what it might mean. The word is actually a very short phrase. It's ketonet pasim. Jacob gave Joseph a ketonet pasim. And if you look in the book of Genesis, that phrase appears nowhere else at all. It's just the story of Joseph, that he gets the garment from his father, that his brothers ultimately rip off of him and tear to pieces. So you say, okay, well, the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, has lots of books to it. Surely Ketonet Pesim appears somewhere else in it. And if you look through the entire Old Testament, this phrase does not appear anywhere else except in 2 Samuel, a story about King David. It's actually a story about King David's daughter, Tamar. And it's a terrible story of sexual violence and of rape and what happens in a family and a nation when people don't take that crime seriously. In the story, David's got multiple wives and sexual partners and lots of half-brothers and sisters are formed. And at one point in the story, Tamar is tricked by her half-brother, lured into his rooms, and she is raped. And in a sign of mourning, she rents her garment. She tears her clothing. And in the text, it says that the princess Tamar is wearing a ketonet pasim. But then it goes on to define it for us. The garment worn by the virgin daughters of the king. A princess dress. Now I can just imagine some traditional 
male scholar looking at the Genesis account, looking at the Second Samuel account, and concluding the exact meaning of the Hebrew word is unclear. I mean, we have no idea what it could mean. It could be anything. Mm -mm, actually, no. If you have any intellectual integrity, you have to admit that one possible interpretation is that Jacob gave his son this female garment. It, it doesn't have to be the only interpretation. It doesn't even have to be the one that you agree with, but it needs to be on the table because it's in the text. And if we follow through on this interpretation for a moment, suddenly the story takes on a whole new light. When the brothers, who already have issues with Joseph, see him in public wearing the ketonet pasim, they get irrationally violent. And they do violence against him and the garment. And yeah, they used it as a clever ruse to trick their father, but if it was such a fine garment that they were jealous about, they would have figured out a way to ditch their brother and somebody would have gone home wearing the ketonet passim. But no, there was something they didn't like about it. There was something transgressive. And, and there's something about their violence that seems punitive, like, we're gonna teach you a lesson. And the violence I hear about in that story reminds me very much about violence I hear about today towards gender non-conforming people, particularly transgender people, especially transgender women of color. Horrific violence against people who are seen as different. Joseph experiences this level of violence from his own brothers. He's shipped off to Egypt, and there in Egypt, he is favored by everyone. He is a beautiful man it says in the text, a descriptor that doesn't happen often with men. But even so, he does get into trouble at one point in the story, and he goes to jail. But even in the all-male prison population, he rises to the top. And then this moment comes when his brothers appear before him. He's second in command of the kingdom at this point, and they don't recognize him. They've come as climate migrants looking for food in a drought. And there they are, assembled before him. He's in full Egyptian drag. Now, he has the right to crush them. If he was like any other man in the family, that's what he was taught, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But he doesn't. He acts in an extremely different way than most men would in his family. He tries to teach them a lesson. He forgives them. He reconciles with them. He becomes like the matriarch of the family, bringing them all together. Not that a man can't do this sort of thing, but back then in that family, you didn't see that modeled. So what Joseph does, he expands the way that a man can respond to conflict. I mean, as a result, I see him as an extremely important gender non-conforming character. Now, if we're gonna talk about gender and the Bible, it's really important to talk about the story of eunuchs. In the Bible, there's a whole group of people known as eunuchs. In the ancient world, in many places, um, there were eunuchs. The broadest definition is these are non-procreative males. And there's some excellent scholarship that's out there by Dr. Janet Everhart, who's looked into eunuchs and has helped me a lot to understand them. Now, often eunuchs were castrated. Uh, and that meant that their testicles were removed, and in some cases, their testicles and their penises. Sometimes this happened in war, and people received this as a punishment um, or before they went into slavery. But very often, people were made eunuchs against their will as young boys. And as a result, they never experienced puberty, like the other males around them. They retained high voices. They didn't get the, the facial hair and the, the body hair that comes with the testosterone, the, the prominent brow. They looked and sounded different from the men and women around them. In the ancient world, there was men, women, and eunuchs, this other. And they appear in many places in the Bible with multiple roles. And if you want to get a picture of the secret lives of eunuchs, I suggest you go to the book of Esther. In the book of Esther, it's fascinating because there are 12 named eunuchs, and they are completely essential to the plot. You take these eunuchs out of the 11 chapters of Esther, and the whole story falls apart before the end of chapter 1. They're really important. So I want us to look at the story of Esther from the perspective of one of the eunuchs in the court. And see, 
What happens in this hidden world of Unix? Oh, you've come at the perfect time. No, it's been absolutely crazy here in the court of Xerxes. Xerxes, the king. That's his Persian name. You probably call him something different. Most people do. <laughs> no, it's been crazy. And of course, it was up to the eunuchs to fix everything, because that's what we do. Yes, I am a eunuch here in King Xerxes' court. Ironically, they call me He Guy. It's my Persian name. The trouble started about seven years ago. Xerxes got it into his head that he wanted to have this blowout party and invite everyone who is anyone from his entire kingdom, which extends from India to Ethiopia. Size queen that he is. Of course, it was up to the eunuchs to make the magic happen. They put me in charge of the decorations. Oh, the banners, the tapestries, the hanging gardens. They're going to be talking about this party for a long time. The celebration lasted for a full six months because here in Persia, when we party, we don't play. It was a huge success, so much so that once we packed everyone up and cleaned the place, Xerxes decided to have a second celebration to honor all of the officials of the court, from the lowest to the highest, and I am one of the highest. This celebration lasted for seven days. On the seventh and final day of the celebration, Xerxes was with his drinking buddies drunk off his royal throne when he summoned me to his side. Almighty, exalted, and really inebriated Xerxes, <laughs> how may I serve my king? He wanted me to go into the harem to fetch Vashti, the queen. She's gorgeous. He wanted to parade her in front of some of his male guests. Well, I tried to explain to him that Vashti's not into that whole thing, but you cannot talk sense to the king. So being a eunuch, as I am, I have pretty much unfettered access into every part of the palace, including the women's quarters. I guess they figure that since I'm technically <laughs> weaponless, that somehow I'm not interested. And we'll let them continue to think that now, won't we? So I went straight into the queen's quarters, right up to the queen, said, oh, Fashti, huge problem with the king. What's that? Yes, he's been drinking again, I know. We need to do that whole intervention thing you've been talking about. But here's the deal, you are gorgeous. The king would like you to do a little walkthrough. In, out, five minutes, you don't have to say a word. She would have none of it. She said, I am no plaything to be dangled in front of these men. I've got a heart. I've got a mind. I've got ideas for this kingdom. I completely agreed with her. I just didn't think it was the best political move to make. So I asked her, Vashti, sweetheart, is that your final answer? That's what I thought. So being the eunuch, I had to be the bearer of bad news, which can prove fatal. Almighty, exalted, and really kind and compassionate Xerxes. We got a little problem with the queen. <laughs> She's temporarily indisposed and poof, he exploded. Rageaholic that he is crying for her head. It took us three days to calm him down. Sadly, Vashti was stripped of her crown, banished from the palace. So for the next few days, I was completely consumed with her, packing her things, finding her a place to stay. Uh, oh, but don't worry about Vashti, she'll be fine. She's a very resourceful woman. In fact, I've encouraged her to write a book about her experiences here in the palace. <laughs> well, as I was busy with the queen, I began to get troubling reports about the king, how he's, he's lonely, he's confused, he's, he's depressed. Without his queen, he doesn't know who he is, please. So I got together with some of the other eunuchs. We came up with this amazing idea that we pitched to the king. Almighty, exalted, and really sad and downtrodden looking Xerxes, we, your royal eunuchs, would love to scour your entire incredibly large kingdom in search of beautiful young women. These we will put through the paces, and when we have some finalists, we will present them to you, and you, 
King Xerxes will decide who will be Persia's next top queen. He loved it. <laughs> He's all about the spectacle. And that's what we did. We went to every backwater place in this kingdom and I nearly despaired. I mean, I saw beautiful women, don't get me wrong, but to be a queen, yeah, that takes somebody special. But then I saw her, beautiful, bright-eyed, flawless complexion, young girl by the name of Hadassah, no more than 15 or 16 years old. I said, young lady, if you like, there might be a place in the palace for you. She said, yes. I brought her here, changed her name to uh, Esther. It's more Persian sounding. Handpicked her handmaidens because you've got to be careful. And I put her on my own personal beauty and diet regime. I prepared her for the big reveal. Now, being a eunuch as I am, the men of the court, well, they don't treat me like one of the boys. Now they often come to me looking for advice or a shoulder to cry on, or they tell me their secrets, and their sexual secrets. I could just be sitting in the garden minding my own business when some judge or general or governor comes by and says, hey, he guy, you know what we'd love to try? To which I always respond, I'm good, thanks. Ugh. But these guys, they always tell me, and let me tell you, some of these guys, freaks, but sometimes this can come in handy. One night, King Xerxes himself invited me to spend the evening with him in his private bedroom chambers. <laughs> well, not for anything like that. The king doesn't do eunuchs, although I've heard rumors. Now we just chatted and knocked back a couple of flasks of wine, and somewhere in the middle of the night, Xerxes leans in and says, Hey, he guy, you know what I would love? I would love if some woman just burst in here and blah, 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 blah. <gasps> he told me his deepest, darkest, freakiest sexual fantasy. And I thought, I'm gonna file this one away. This one can come in handy someday. And sure enough, the day came. The day when Esther was summoned to appear before King Xerxes. No, 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 no. You've got nothing to worry about, I told her. You are beautiful. You've always been. I do admit my beauty regime has worked wonders. No, you're fine. But when you go into the king's private bedroom chamber, I want you to bring only what I tell you. Nothing more, nothing less. I want you to bring this feather, <laughs> this leather strap. <laughs> oh, yes, and this... <laughs> Overripened mango. Trust me, it'll all make sense, okay? So you go in there, you have a good time, don't worry about anything. Yeah, that's when I worried about everything. I mean, I'd been getting closer to the king, and if he selected Esther as his queen, well then, it would be very good for my career. Uh, had nothing to worry about. First thing in the morning, Xerxes comes bounding out of his chamber, puts his bare paw around me and says, hey, he guy, that Esther of yours, she just burst in here and blah, 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 blah. However, did she know? So then Esther became Queen Esther. And then, and then all hell broke loose. Because turns out she's part of some minority population. We're very inclusive here in the kingdom. But somehow there was an official in the court who didn't like her people and passed an edict to utterly destroy them. How did these things even get through? So being the eunuch, I had to go to the queen's quarters and talk to her. I went out of the palace to talk to some cousin or uncle of hers. I went to the king's people. I set up some lunches. We smoothed the whole thing over. Some heads had to roll because that's how they solve problems around here. But the important thing is she is firmly in her place. He is firmly in his place. And I, well, you see, behind every great monarchy, there is a he guy.
Now, the Hebrew word for eunuch is saris, and it's often translated in English Bibles as official. So anytime you're reading the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament and you see the word official, well, there was a, a team of editors who had to decide, are we gonna say official or eunuch, or are we gonna say a eunuch who was an official? Going back to the Joseph story for a moment, Joseph was a slave for a time of the official Potiphar which also can be translated the eunuch Potiphar. Uh, and then, yeah, he had a wife, but sometimes eunuchs in high positions would have wives. And, and, and if Potiphar was a eunuch, well, suddenly the story looks a little bit different because there's this important scene where Joseph is um, seduced by Potiphar's wife. And she's often portrayed as this lascivious cougar looking for young male flesh. But maybe there's a different story. Maybe she's married to a eunuch, she can't have her own children, and she sees this young man in the house and thinks, well, here's a potential sperm donor. I don't know, but it's another way of looking at it. Now, a lot of people know a famous story of an Ethiopian eunuch. Uh, this is a Christian story from the book of Acts. But what a lot of people don't know is there are actually two Ethiopian eunuchs in the Bible. There's the one in Acts chapter eight, but also one in the Old Testament in Jeremiah 38. Now in the story, Jeremiah is a prophet. I know you thought he was a bullfrog. It's a misconception that people have. No, he's actually a prophet. And like most prophets, he's got a message of gloom and doom. The message was basically this. Y'all are misbehaving. And as a result, you're gonna be judged. You're gonna be attacked. You're gonna be dragged off into exile. And God's message is, just go with it. But you know, the problem is people don't like to be called losers and um, people like to fight. And so when Jeremiah gave this message, they were like, please. And now at the time though, the king was very sympathetic towards Jeremiah, but the king didn't have a lot of power. And at one point, Jeremiah gets arrested by his enemies there in the nation. He's dragged into the palace and he's in prison. He's dropped into a dry cistern or a well and he's left there to die. Enter Ebed Melech. To me, one of the most exciting Bible heroes. Ebed Melech is from Cush. He's a Cushite, modern day Ethiopia, Eritrea. Uh, and he is an official of the court. He is a eunuch. He's an Ethiopian eunuch. This complete outsider who is there serving in this court, he's concerned about Jeremiah, goes to the king and says, your servant Jeremiah, he's gonna die. We've gotta do something. And the king's like, yeah, my hands are tied here. I, I don't know, but you know, it's, how about I give you some fighting men and you go see what you can do? So with his little team, Evid Melek organizes this special ops midnight raid to Navy SEAL Jeremiah out of the palace. And it's a brilliant campaign from, as far as we can tell, no one gets injured. They sort of just like ninja in and ninja out and they come out with the old man prophet. And, and Evid Melek thinks of everything. He brings rope, obviously, to pull up the old man prophet but he also brings old rags. And with these old rags, he throws them down to the prophet and says, take these rags and put them under your arms so that when we pull you up, the ropes won't cut into your skin and injure you as we're rescuing you. And I, I just love this about Ebed Melech. He's thorough and thoughtful, like thinking about Jeremiah in such intimate details. He doesn't want to harm him. And so in essence, what we have in this story is a black African surgically altered gender variant savior. Uh, this is a story worth talking about. Now in Jeremiah chapter 39, Jeremiah runs into Ebed Melech and, and thanks him for saving his life. And, and also says, you know, these people, they're not listening and they're gonna be in big trouble. But you, since you showed me this kindness, God is going to bless you not bless you and your whole household as the traditional blessing would go because that wasn't really easily possible for a eunuch, but God is going to bless you. Which of course then brings us to the other Ethiopian eunuch. Now to tell this story of this other Ethiopian eunuch, I wanna introduce you to a character. Um, 
a disciple of Jesus. You don't need to know who this disciple is um, to understand what's happening here, uh, but I want to introduce you to this disciple of Jesus who will narrate the story for us and give us a little bit of an idea of what's going on with this Ethiopian eunuch. We know a lot about the Ethiopian eunuch, actually, in Acts chapter 8. There's more things that we know about this character than anybody else in the Gospels other than Jesus, yet we don't know the character's name. So I give a name. Uh, I give a gender-neutral name of Desta, an Ethiopian name. So with that, here is a disciple of Jesus unpacking the story of the Ethiopian eunuch. Growing up in Jerusalem, we always went to the temple. I love the temple with all of the courtyards and the fountains and people from all over the world. Now, when you come to our temple, on the one side, you'll see the men with their long beards and the young men trying to grow their beards, <laughs> reading scripture, discussing politics, arguing. And on the other side are the women and the children playing games, preparing food, discussing politics, arguing. <laughs> And I remember when I was little, at the temple, I would sometimes see Desta. Desta was beautiful and handsome. Desta looked to me like a woman, but dressed as a man. Very dark, darker than us, from Africa, and rich, an official from a royal court. Desta often came to Jerusalem on business and being devout would come to our temple. And I don't know why, but I always wanted to talk to Desta. And, and one day I, I said to my cousins, let's go introduce ourselves. And they said, no, our parents forbid it. That one is unclean. That one is deformed. That one is a eunuch. So I never spoke with Desta. But I saw Desta return year after year, always looking a little bit older and sadder and staying less and less time with us. But recently I heard good news that one of the apostles actually met Desta and spoke with Desta. It was Philip on the south road going out of Jerusalem, when who should come rumbling by in a magnificent chariot but Desta, hunched over, reading from a scroll of the prophet Isaiah. Philip, always very friendly, shouted up and said, Friend, do you understand what you're reading? It seems I understand little, but if you know the scriptures, come, explain it to me. I've been puzzling over this passage, speaking of a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. Tell me, does the prophet speak of himself or of someone else? For this passage sounds familiar to me. Like a sheep before the shearers is silent, like a lamb before the slaughter, he too opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can speak of his offspring, for his life was cut off? Tell me, does the prophet speak of himself or of someone else? For this story sounds familiar to me. So Philip talked about Jesus and the time that we were together and how we let lots of people come near. Women, lepers. Jesus had nice things to say about eunuchs too. So they continued to read as they traveled until they came to a portion of Isaiah's prophecy that 
neither of them had ever seen before. Perhaps they don't read it in the assembly, but it was a promise from God to eunuchs. But reading it that day, on a chariot, it seemed as if it were a promise for Desta. Well, let us continue our reading then, shall we? Thus saith the Lord, let not the eunuch say, I am a dried up old tree with no future and no hope. For to those eunuchs who keep my command and honor my Sabbath, I will give you a memorial better than sons and daughters. I will write your name on the walls of my house, and you will never be cut off. Well then, what is the stop? journey, Philip explained that when we become disciples, we get baptized. It's a sign that we die to our old lives and we're more free to live as ourselves. Desta has since returned home to Ethiopia and has spread the good news and there is surrounded by many brothers and sisters, sons and daughters. Desta always had lots of money, but now Desta is truly rich. Growing up, going to white Christian churches, I heard an awful lot about the Ethiopian eunuch, regularly came up in sermons. Uh, but it's interesting, the references that were made, you never get a sense that this is a an African character, a person of color, and definitely not a gender or sexual minority. And in fact, most of the sermons I heard, it wasn't even about the eunuch. It was either a message saying, like Philip, you two should go and preach the word and convert people. Or it was a delivery system for Jesus. The, the eunuch is reading from a Hebrew scripture, uh, Isaiah 53. And superimposed on that often is a prophecy that Jesus is going to suffer and die for our sins. And, and that's how it's presented. This is a story about Jesus. But I'm wondering about this eunuch. And in playing the eunuch, I, I wondered about how this person was feeling reading this text, having just come from the temple, a highly gendered space, males on one side, females on the other. Where do they go? some third outsider space. And how did this person feel surrounded by so many families? And that's just not in the cards. And so this person struggling to understand a, a passage of scripture, asking all these questions, who is it that the prophet is speaking of, himself or someone else? Really curious about the identity of the character in the Isaiah passage. Someone who, like a sheep before the shearers is silent, like a lamb before the slaughter, he too opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can speak of his offspring? For his life was cut off. Sounds familiar to the eunuch. Uh, and I wonder if the eunuch wasn't asking, is this about some savior? Or rather, is this a story about a eunuch? Is this my story in the Bible? I don't know, but I think it's really important that we see that the first baptism of the early church was of this person who had so many intersecting identities, a black, African, surgically altered, gender variant, rich, literate, civil servant, who was a person of faith. That the early church had this radical inclusion that they would go out of their way to share the good news with this person. I mean, consider all of those intersections and diversities of identity right there in the early church. I want to end with 
a final story from the Gospels. It's a well-known story about a completely unknown character. It's just the one-line reference. Um, but I want to add some background to it since there's so little there. Uh, and the important thing I want you to see is that this is a character who is potentially acting outside of a gender norm. And it's a very important story. Sometimes the most important people in the most important stories are overlooked. And our narrator, this disciple of Jesus, will help us see this often overlooked character come to life for us. I once met someone who didn't quite fit. It was the time of the Passover. We didn't know where we would spend our Passover. Jesus often kept plans till the last minute. We began getting word from our families, inviting us to celebrate with them. They added, you could even bring your friends, although they smell funny. <laughs> And it was the day before the Passover that Simon Peter persuaded me to ask Jesus, Teacher, where will we have our Passover? And Jesus said, I want you, Thomas, and Philip to go down to the city and down to the well. There you will find a man carrying a pitcher of water. Follow that one and say to the master of the house that we have need of a place for our Passover. There you will find an upper room, fully furnished. Go, make preparations there. Well, Simon Peter exploded. He said, teacher, this is outrageous. There are no empty rooms. We needed to make our plans weeks, months ago. And besides, you're sending them on a fool's errand to find a man carrying a pitcher of water. Everybody knows only women and children carry water. They're gonna be walking around the city for days. Jesus said, go, you will find it, just as I tell you. Thomas, Philip, and me, we got up and we went down into the city. And we walked down towards the well, and sure enough, there in the distance, there was this man carrying a pitcher of water. Well, the story behind this one, earlier, that same day, Levi had gathered all of his family in his father's house. His grandparents, aunts, uncles, brothers, sisters, cousins, all their small children. And when they had all settled, he turned to them and said, Dear ones, we're about to begin our celebration of the Passover, our deliverance from bondage to new life. And I have something to confess, and that I've often felt as if I were a slave. It's not that you treated me badly, it's just that... Well, you remember, when I was little, I liked to play with my sisters and my girl cousins, and you said, oh, it's just a phase, he'll grow out of it. But I never did. I just grew secretive. And through the years, I, I realized that there must be something wrong with me, that somehow the inside of me doesn't match the outside. I mean, inside, I always felt like a little girl growing up into a woman, but outside, you've only ever known me as Levi. So I've turned to the Lord. I called upon the name of the Lord, God, who desires truth in the inward part. And God has given me peace. So as we begin our Passover celebrations, I choose to live my life outwardly, as it's always been inwardly, as female. And from now on, I would like you to call me Miriam. It was as if a demon had materialized. There was yelling and screaming, renting of garments in mourning, mothers taking their children out of the house. The father raged around, screaming, you're ruining Passover, look what you're doing to your mother. But Miriam stood still in the midst of the chaos 
and then she saw it. The empty pitcher. She reached for it. Her father grabbed her hand and said, Young man, what do you think you're doing? Father, I feel as if I'm a woman. I, I don't mind holding the pitcher. Young man, please, don't go out with that pitcher. Think of your mother. If you go out with that, no good would come of it. Father, you know I've always honored you and mother. Come good or evil, I don't know, but one thing I do know, I must obey God. So for the first time since she was little, Miriam stepped outside, carrying the pitcher. The neighbors looked on in shock and horror that somebody from such a good family would be doing something so outrageous. She came to the well and the women there saw her and laughed and moved aside. And there at that well, she took the clay jar and she plunged it into the cool, cool waters and then placed it onto her strong, strong shoulders and turned to go home. And it was at that moment that we saw this one that looked like a man carrying a pitcher of water. We ran up to that person and said, so is it true that you have an empty room where we can have our Passover? Oh, thanks to me, all the rooms are now empty. So then I said, well, would you like me to carry that for you? You must feel very embarrassed holding it. No, it feels quite comfortable, normal. You see, I am Miriam. So this character, the man with the pitcher of water, it's an important character. Um, now, we don't know why this man was carrying water. If you look in even an NIV study Bible, there'll be a note at the bottom that says that typically men didn't carry water like this. It was a rare act. It would be like saying, go to downtown and you're gonna see a man with a suit on, red pumps, floral hat, a big purse, follow that person. It would have stood out. And if it was so common for men to be doing this, well, there would have been 50 or 100 of them. How would the disciples know which one to follow? It had to stand out. Now, why is this person doing it? I don't know. I mean, now, typically, male slaves, they would carry water. But the Greek word here doesn't say male slave. It says you will find a man. This was a unique, special act. And I don't know why this person is carrying a pitcher of water. It could be a class transgressive act or a gender transgressive act. But what I do know is that when Jesus needed a room, he said, go and find this man. And this man led them to that room, which led them to their last supper, which leads us to Holy Communion today, those people in a Christian tradition. And right dab smack in the middle of that story is this gender non-conforming person. And to me, that's important. Transfigurations, transgressing gender in the Bible. I'm so glad I can share this with you. For me, it's been amazing to just see people that I've often overlooked hidden in the text. This work of looking at Bible characters and thinking about their gender, of acting out the stories, for me, this is important Bible scholarship to open up the conversations about gender. What about someone who lives outside of the margins? These are characters who don't fit in the traditional world. Not male, not female, something in the middle or altogether different. I don't know what that all means. But to me, as someone who loves the Bible and loves communicating, to me it's just important to focus in the lens on people who are often overlooked. I'm not saying that these are the definitive interpretations. There's many ways of looking at these stories. Uh, but I can definitely say that in looking at them this way, it's, it's very much enriched my life. And I'm really grateful that we can have this conversation.